meaning anything that can't fuel Leo's jet. It raises this question, how did Leo get here from Cali? Did he ride in on a horizontal solar-powered windmill animated by unicorn flatulence? Yeah. I know. <laughs> Leo gave Trump a copy of his climate flick, which has more holes in it than a peewee golf course. Yep, this is what we need, a jet-setting, yacht-lounging actor telling us how to live. But it's odd that Leo's at Trump Tower, especially after who was just there. Mm. The climate Bigfoot himself, Al Gore. I thought the point of Trump was to reverse this pretentious parade of elitist planet propagandists. So what's the deal? Perhaps it's Ivanka welcoming these climate kooks to offset her dad's skepticism. Remember, climate change is the one arena where the scientific method, the testing and modification of theories, is actually scorned. Infected by political ideology, if you dare question climate models, your career is done. But it's not that climate change doesn't exist. It's the irrational action linked to climate models that's bad, and Leo loves those models. But wait, Donald Trump just picked fossil fuel ally Scott Pruitt to head the EPA. Nancy Pelosi says Pruitt must be blocked for the sake of our planet and our children. Bernie Sanders agrees the left is flipping out. So it's a good choice. Talk about a head fake. Somewhere Al Gore is fuming, which only creates wo more global warming. Our series on the first 100 days of the Trump presidency continues tonight with a look at national security. It was one of Donald Trump's major issues in the campaign. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge reports on the big problems and what we know about Mr. Trump's solutions. I'm very hopeful that we can put this behind us and finally have somebody that can actually say the word Islamic terrorism. I hope they can focus on doing what's right and not what's politically correct or politically, you know, advantageous to, to themselves. Now medically retired from the Army Reserve, Sean Manning and his wife Autumn live 60 miles outside Seattle in Yelm, Washington. The legacy of his army service includes two bullets still lodged in his back and leg after Nadal Hassan opened fire in 2009, killing 13 and injuring more than 30 others at Fort Hood in Texas. When I went down to the ground, Hassan kept shooting me. He ended up shooting, putting a, another five rounds into me. I still can't shake the phone call. The phone call was the hardest. Um, sorry. Um, I see it's still replaced in my head. Married just six weeks before the attack, they now soar through a mountain of paperwork and navigate the VA bureaucracy. We've had to have x-rays done and on two instances we were turned away because we were told that the machine was broken down. As part of his Restoring National Security Act, then candidate Trump promised major changes. How many veterans? The right to seek private medical care when they can't get proper service. My only fear would be if they switch to a privatized system is some of the care at the VA facilities could be degraded. I mean, I hope they focus initially on, hey, let's fix the problems with the system that we have. The Restoring National Security Act also pledges to eliminate defense budget cuts known as the sequester and to expand military investment. This summer, a Fox News Pentagon team report about maintenance crews taking extreme measures struck a chord. Our young people, the greatest in the world, are flying planes that when they need parts, they go to a plane museum or they go to an airplane graveyard because they don't even make the parts anymore. The Manning say ending sequestration should be a priority. Coupled with the VA frustrations, it adds another layer of stress. I've had some friends that had basically been given pink slips and they were close to retirement and it was quite a shock that they were booted out. The president-elect's national security strategy is broad, including both the defense and homeland security departments, from the warfighter to the border agent, as well as the intelligence professional who tracks the cyber threat. The plan is ambitious and will likely challenge the established order. This November 17th transition video calls on senior military leaders to develop a comprehensive plan to protect America's vital infrastructure from cyber attacks and all other form of attacks. You see a real uptick in 2017 with cyber attacks. I do. It, it will be a dark year. We'll see more destructive attacks, attacks that dismantle the integrity of data. Leading cybersecurity expert Tom Kellerman says elevating the issue is the right thing, but there will be resistance. There's too much of a turf 
rapport between the various government agencies that are responsible for dealing with cyber attacks in today's world. We need much more cooperation and collaboration. Immigration is the final component, calling for new screening procedures and a stronger border. This week, the House Committee's Republican chairman promised to draft legislation. We will put in place a historic, multi-layered defense system so that drug cartels and terrorists don't slip through the cracks. The incoming president's first 100 days seem like a drop in the bucket for the Mannings, who are still waiting more than 2,500 days for his injuries to be deemed combat-related. Getting the Purple Heart last year was progress. Now they hope Mr. Trump will live up to his tweets. I remembered that tweet of his support back in 2012, and that's exactly why I voted for him. It's not a left or a right thing. You know, it should be an American thing. In Washington, Catherine Herridge, Fox News. Tomorrow, we'll look at the promises that President-elect Trump made to drain the swamp in Washington. And what he whether Donald do. Trump is already president. He is certainly acting like it today. The president-elect met with families and first responders from last week's brutal terrorist attack at Ohio State University. The event comes as Trump continues his search for the best fit to be his top dip diplomat. And on top of that, another celebration with his supporters tonight in Iowa. Correspondent Peter Ducey is in Des Moines right now. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Chris. It was just a few minutes ago that the president-elect left the campus of Ohio State University. He headed for John Glenn International Airport there in Columbus on his way here to Iowa. But he did meet for about 40 minutes with victims of that recent stabbing spree on campus and the first responders who stepped in to save them. We just saw the victims and the families, and we were uh, really, I mean, these were really brave people, amazing people. Uh, the police and first responders were incredible. The job uh, done in particular by one young gentleman was incredible. The president-elect hosted a pair of potential Secretary of State contenders in Manhattan. Retired four-star Admiral James Stavridis and former Ford and Boeing CEO Alan Mulally. Stavridis was actually vetted as a running mate earlier this year for Hillary Clinton and used to be a big critic of Mr. Trump. I think he does not seem to have a grasp of the issues uh, that are facing the nation. But after emerging from Trump Tower's golden elevators, the retired admiral sounded like an admirer. I found it to be a, a very interesting and a very informed conversation. Mullally's invitation is intriguing because his resume includes stints at two recent Trump targets. Boeing, singled out earlier this week as spending too much on the next generation of Air Force One, and Ford, which Mr. Trump repeatedly warns against building any more of its cars out of the country. You're not going to have any cars coming across the border unless you pay a 35% tax. That's it. Transition officials are stressing that Ford, under Mullally, was the only big American car company not to take bailout money. The Trump cabinet room continued quickly filling up today with the announcement that Mr. Trump wants Andy Puzder as labor secretary. Puzder is the CEO of CKE Restaurants, which runs Hardee's and Carl's Jr., and the businessman regularly advocates against raising the minimum wage. That labor department pick followed a night of fighting with organized labor. The head of a union representing some Indiana carrier workers thinks the president-elect inflated the number of jobs saved there, telling the Washington Post this week, quote, Trump and Pence, they pulled a dog and pony show on the numbers. At Real Donald Trump on Twitter replied, quote, Chuck Jones, who is president of United Steelworkers 1999, has done a terrible job representing workers. No wonder companies flee country. There are also new questions today about whether or not Mr. Trump will completely sever ties with his company by Inauguration Day. As the New York Times reports, he may keep a stake. Trump lawyer Michael Cohen responded this morning. And everybody's concentrating on what he's going to do with the business. They're going to find out on December 15th. Here in Des Moines, it is very, very cold out, but it's looking like it'll be a warm welcome inside High V Hall for the president-elect, who will be joined tonight on the third stop of the Thank You Victory Tour by the president-elect and this state's governor, Terry Branstad, who the next administration hopes to send to China as the next U.S. ambassador there. Chris? Peter Ducey reporting from Des Moines. Peter, thanks for that. One of Canada Trump's rallying cries was getting rid of what he called disastrous trade deals and leveling the playing field for American goods and workers. But many Republicans are resisting Trump's ideas about how to accomplish that. Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry is here tonight to tell us why. 
Donald Trump has not even been sworn into office, and top Republicans are already balking at his push for a massive tariff on companies that ship jobs overseas. With House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy warning of a trade war, while Speaker Paul Ryan today tried to brush off Mr. Trump's tariff more diplomatically, saying the focus should be on cutting corporate taxes. We believe that the best way to get at this issue is through comprehensive tax reform. While the president-elect has warmed the hearts of Republicans with promises of major tax cuts, he's upending conservative orthodoxy dating back decades with a thank you tour that sometimes makes him sound more like a Democrat. The era of economic surrender is over. The bottom 90 percent, uh, the working class families have not seen a raise in 20 or 30 years. And Mr. Trump is pushing that 35 percent tariff on companies for outsourcing, a move that Moody's warned could plunge the U.S. into recession, shrink the economy by 4.6 percent, put 4 million workers out of jobs and lead to another 3.3 million jobs not being created. All on top of the carrier deal that also ran counter to GOP gospel on free markets. We can't be giving special interest favors to businesses every time they threaten to leave. Yet conservative economist Stephen Moore noted Mr. Trump could calm the right and make the tariff debate moot by pushing through major tax reform and regulatory relief. And the president-elect has already signaled 35 percent is just an opening gambit to deal with the fact that in October alone, the U.S. had a trade deficit of $40 billion. Including more than a $30 billion trade deficit with China alone. All right? Think we're doing a good job in negotiating? I don't think so. And Moore, who worked on the Trump campaign but is not involved in the transition, notes there's no denying the president-elect's success so far. Not only did Donald Trump win with this message, but look at what has happened to the stock market. Look at what has happened to consumer confidence. Look at what's happened to his approval rating. This is a president who's on a roll. Moore did warn that Mr. Trump has to be careful that a whole bunch of companies may now be lining up on Pennsylvania Avenue here in Washington and Fifth Avenue in New York looking for goodies. Chris? Ed, thank you. Well, less than two weeks, a group of 538 people will officially choose the President of the United States. They are called electors and they are specified in the Constitution. Most of us assume they are mere conduits for the will of voters and will cast their ballots consistent with Electoral College results. And yet in some states, they don't have to do that. They can do literally whatever they want. Texas is one of those states, and that's where we find Christopher Suprin. He's a Republican elector who says he will not vote for Donald Trump. Christopher joins us from Dallas. Christopher, thanks a lot for coming on tonight. So, Thank you. I, I'm happy to be on your new show. Thank you. I, I assume this election was over and that Trump won, and you're saying no. Th that's correct. December huh. 19 is when the election actually happens. Uh, right. I'm actually surprised you didn't know that, but that's when electors actually cast their ballots, and that's when uh, we will find out who is president. Right. I guess what I, and of course I'm aware of that it's in the Article Two, it's in the Twelfth Amendment, it's well known the Electoral mm -hmm. College. But the idea that the result could change based on electoral, the meeting of the Electoral College uh, in two weeks, I'm not aware that that could happen. And I think most people who cast their ballots last month assumed that the result they woke up to was the one that would stand and you're saying no. Well we've had multiple electors at different times in our history who have uh, not voted either as a party wanted or as their region wanted. Uh, the last I think it was in 2004 may have been my by mistake when a Democratic elector uh, flipped right. John Kerry and John Edwards. Yeah, by mistake. Uh, right. And perhaps in 1976 would be more applicable where current Washington State Senator Mike Patton said rather than voting for Gerald Ford, he would make a pro-life statement and vote for President Reagan. But there are certainly times when that's happened. Well, so here's, here's, the, here's the problem I have with it, and I think most people would. So you had an awful lot of people vote. I, uh, I think it was a, a, around 128 million people voted overall in this election, 62-ish, three for Donald Trump. And here you have 538 people saying, or at least in your case, one person saying, my vote counts more than any of yours and I'm going in a different direction. It seems undemocratic is the point I'm making. It may be undemocratic, but it's certainly exactly what the founders established. They wanted an electoral college per Alexander Hamilton uh, to say no when it was appropriate for uh, a candidate that they thought, felt it was not preeminently qualified to be president. Yeah, that's, and that's not what mentioned anywhere in the Constitution, as, as you know. There's, there's no reference to the motives of electors in the Constitution. Um, not in the Constitution, so, I mean, right, not in the Constitution, right? So, who are you going to vote for? 
I, I'm not sure who I'm going to vote for. In the op-ed I published on Monday, I said someone like John Kasich. I'm still looking for someone with executive and legislative experience. And since the op-ed, I've been lucky to have multiple electors actually across the land uh, call me on the phone. We've had some interesting conversations. But when the topic of who to vote for comes up, the name that keeps trickling back to the top is John Kasich again and again. He said he doesn't, he doesn't want to be voted for. But again, what gives you the power to do that? I mean, the whole point of the system is that you are standing in by proxy for millions of your fellow citizens and doing their will. And you're saying, in effect, I don't care what you think. I'm doing what I want, even though my job is to stand in for you, if you see the point. Well, I disagree with the point. It's not to stand in for someone else. There's no constitutional uh, assumption that the Electoral College is simply a rubber stamp. Otherwise, they would have simply said the states would award those uh, values to those candidates. Again, it's not in the Constitution, but certainly in Federalist 68, the Founding Fathers had an idea that they were worried about a demagogue took, taking over office, uh, simply winning by the mob mentality, and it hasn't happened. We've been lucky okay. in America thus far, but this year's but, but different. Wait, I, I get it, and I get you don't like Trump, and I think that's totally fine if you don't like Trump. And a demagogue is a scary prospect from either side. But you really want a country run by 538 people who are accountable to no one. That's what you're proposing. Why is that better? Well, I'm not, well, I'm not proposing that. Yeah, you are. That. You're and saying I should be able to vote for anybody. I have, I have authority vested in me by, I don't know. I don't know where your authority comes from. I don't know how you became an elector. And yet you're saying, you know, just on the basis of my own conscience, I'm going to attempt to control the destiny of a country of 330 million. That seems as scary as a, as a despotism to me. I understand your point. In this case, I was elected at the Republican state convention, so I can't speak to the Democratic Party in Texas or in other states for either party. Right. But in my case, I was elected, so there is some accountability. Where's the accountability? Uh, I'm not sh well, the accountability is you're, you were elected by a body uh, through a process. It, right, it's so not really see, you don't... It's, it's, right, but there's no accountability. I mean, nothing happens to you. Sure, but I mean, nothing. There's no accountability because you can vote for whomever you want. No one can do anything to you. You can't be fined. You can't lose your job. There's no. I mean, there's literally no accountability, right? Well, it, I guess that depends on the brushback you're looking at. Well, what would the accountability be? Well, there's certainly been a number of Twitter threats and things like that saying your political career is over. You can't run for office again. Things of that nature. So electors, I'm sure, will take that into account when they vote. But I think they will also consider the future of the country, not just their own personal self-interest. So Leaders you, are supposed well, to do... But isn't the country supposed to be governed by its population? I mean, there are hundreds of millions of people in the country. They had an opportunity to vote. I, Every adult over 18 had an opportunity to vote. And uh, you know, more than 100 million of them did. And they made their preference clear, per the rules. And you're saying, I don't care what they did. And you're more over saying, oh yeah, oh go ahead. I was going to say, let me make sure I heard you right. You say the nation should be governed by the population? Yes. Because if that's the case, we wouldn't have an electoral college. We'd have a popular vote or a national popular vote. Well, the electoral college the electoral reflects, reflects, of course, the results in the states. So, I mean, it's not pure democracy, but it's still representing the desire Correct. of 128 million people, not 538, or in your case, one. Here's my last question to you. You describe yourself, and I think I'm quoting, as a moral elector. Are you suggesting that people who are voting for Trump in the Electoral College two weeks from now are immoral? No, I'm saying I'm taking a conscious decision to consider who I'm voting for. I don't think Donald Trump meets the test to be qualified to be president. And well, I why hope frame other it in moral terms? Do, uh, because what other terms would you prefer? I don't know, political terms, preference. I mean, I, I, I like this guy, I don't like that guy, but instead you're bringing it to a moral level. I'm making a moral choice, and the implication is others aren't. And I'm saying, why even frame it that way? Because it's, it's I mean, it brings the conversation to a different and much more heated level when you say, I'm making the moral choice, which is what you're saying. Well, well I am making a moral choice. I am choosing to examine uh, his qualifications. There are probably other people who may be doing the same thing and coming to a different conclusion, and that's fine. That's why we have an electoral college to cast these votes. Last question. What do you think would happen to the country, to the, the social fabric, to the stability of the country upon which everything else is built, if somehow the election were taken away from Trump in the electoral college? That's a great question, and my answer to that is the electoral college is part of the Constitution. It follows under uh, the rule of law, so if Mr. Trump gets 270 electoral votes, he will be president. If he doesn't, 
and no one gets 270 votes, it'll go to the House of Representatives, as yeah. described in Amendment 12, and the rule of law will exist. For yeah, me to well, vote we'll against Mr. Trump or for someone else is a legal vote, but to suggest insurrection right. as a uh, source well, not, of... Uh, of course I'm not suggesting you, you insurrection. Are not, I mean, I'm, I'm merely saying certain, if certain you people tell are, people in the end it's not a democracy and a small group of unelected people like you get to make the choice, they're going to freak out. I'm just noting that because that's the way it works. Christopher, thanks a lot for joining us. In that statement tonight, still mystery surrounding the appointment of Secretary of State. Where has Rudy Giuliani gone? Join us now from Washington, Fox News National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin. So, um, you know all these sources, and you're like <laughs> meeting people at 2 a.m., and they're whispering to you. So give me a rundown what the Secretary of State situation is like. Well, I actually did have a conversation this evening, Bill, that gave me a, a little bit of the lay of the land for the Secretary of State pick. And right now I'm told that Rex Tillerson, the ExxonMobil uh, chairman who met with Donald Trump at Trump Tower on Tuesday, that his stock is really rising. Uh, he has the benefit of not only having run a country, a company that is in 50 countries, including war toward Yemen. He has long relationships with Vladimir Putin from his work in Russia, going back to the Yeltsin era. Uh, Donald Trump, I'm told, was very impressed with him, and I'm told to expect another meeting in the coming days. All right, so the man's name is Rex Tillerson. Tillerson is the CEO of ExxonMobil, businessman, obviously. Um, I'm not sure whether the Iranians, you know, because that's the Secretary of State's top job. If Trump is going to do something about the Iran nuke deal. But I don't know, uh, Mr. Tillerson, and I'll take your word for it. What about, what about Mitt Romney? Is he uh, still in the hunt? Mitt Romney is still in the mix. Uh, there are concerns in the Trump camp that that speech he gave in March to the Hinckley Institute, in which he said that Donald Trump would be dangerous as president, that that would follow him from capital to capital as he uh, made his way around the world, and that they just are concerned that they may not be able to get beyond that. And there also are concerns that since he was not close to Donald Trump during the election, uh, does he really speak for the president uh, once he is in charge? Uh, so concerns about Romney. You also have Rudy Giuliani, who you mentioned. He has not been seen uh, coming in and out of Trump Tower uh, by our producers who've been staked out there for the last two weeks. I'm told that he is a little bit on the outs right now, uh, that uh, President-elect Trump was very uh, put off, if you will. Uh, he was offered DHS chief. Um, he turned it down. Department of um, Homeland Security. Department so of Homeland could, Security. He could have been the ICE czar, Giuliani. And he turned he it down outright? He turned it down, I'm told, that he could yeah. have had it. And, uh, of course, General uh, John Kelly, a four-star Marine, was offered that and has said that he would uh, accept that right. position. So that's a, a fine choice over at DHS. But Giuliani was also publicly touting, uh, saying that he wanted Secretary of State. He spoke at a Wall Street Journal CEO council recently uh, in mid-November, in which uh, Donald Trump, I'm told, was uh, somewhat put off by his publicly talking about how he would be the perfect Secretary of State. So he was lobbying uh, with the Wall Street Journal uh, people. And Trump didn't like that, according to your sources, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Now, that being said, Rudy Giuliani was probably one of the closest people to Trump during the election. And yeah. as one source told me, you know, the two, he could finish, you know, the president-elect's Yeah, that's why everybody's surprised so we, haven't, we haven't seen the mayor and we don't yeah. know where he is. And I thought yeah. he might be at your house having snacks. <laughs> now, we're looking at uh, Vice President-elect Pence. He's in Iowa, going to warm up the crowd for Donald Trump. Um, so when Mr. Trump comes on, we'll take that speech. Now, what about uh, General Petraeus, former CIA chief? Is he still in the running for Secretary of State or anything else? Excellent, excellent question. Um, I think that once the four-star Marine General John Kelly was chosen for DHS, it makes it very difficult for Donald Trump to choose another uh, retired four-star to be his Secretary of State. That being said, I'm told from sources very close to Donald Trump that he really liked uh, General Petraeus when he met with him. They spoke for over an hour. It was a, a meeting of minds. So I think they are still trying to find a position for General What about General going Petraeus. back to the CIA? Uh -huh. Well, remember Pompeo. Mike Pompeo it has already been offered that position. Oh, so I that forgot position that. Isn't, oh, yeah. I'm so that's very, not thank open. you for correcting me. Um, <laughs> so Pompeo is going to be CIA chief. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of other chiefs. There's like DIA chief. D, D, and, well, DNI, DNI, uh, Director of National Intelligence. That would oversee the 17 intelligence agencies. I wouldn't rule that out as yeah. a possibility. NSA, National Security yeah. Agency, those secret yeah. guys. 
Again, um, I think the concern I think the concern is that they don't want to be accused of having a junta. They don't want so ma uh, too they, many generals. Too many generals, but at the same time, the generals are the ones that uh, Donald Trump seems to uh, be relating the most to. I right, like those tough guys. Jennifer, thanks very much. We appreciate it. <laughs>